Good morning, church. Let's stand together and sing. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain moon. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. No, there is nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So and I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see an empty tomb. So and I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I pay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you in every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You in every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So and I'll fight. I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God. The battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Awesome job. Great way to start a service. Amen? Amen. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Tom Hughes. If I didn't get a chance to meet you, I'm thrilled that we can all come together in service and celebrate Jesus Christ and worship him this morning and get to learn and grow together in Christ. If you are new to Prairie Bible Church, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Hope that you can enjoy this experience as well. And I also want to take a chance and welcome a few visitors we have with us that we have each and every Sunday. Well, it's great to see the seats filled and fill this building with Jesus' love. We also have a lot of people that are worshiping online with us this morning. Before we get this, I know there's some people walking in here. This is our equip study. Well, we're getting it here. These are students that are learning more about Jesus. They're taking a chance each and every Sunday here to meet with Pastor Craig and Lisa, and they're learning about Jesus and how they want to grow and equip them to be better stewards. So we are thankful that you guys are running late. That means hopefully it was a great class, right? 
<clears throat> Good. Yeah, Lisa said it's a great class. <clears throat> Some of the other visitors that I am mentioning here that are worshiping with us this morning are online. And there's a little camera right above the door, and if I could, I would love it if you would all, with me, stand up and wave to the camera and welcome them to service this morning as well. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> There's a couple of things if you are newer to Prairie Bible Church, whether this is your first Sunday or maybe the first month or two that you've been coming, welcome. We're glad that you're here. There's a couple of things I want to hit on. <clears throat> We've got some simple brochures out on the tables in the hallway that if you're willing uh, to just grab one of those when you leave, it, gets, it gives some information about who we are as a church, what we believe, and how we're trying to help support in our community. The second thing is, every Sunday, the last Sunday of the month, every once a month, we're, go, we're having a, what's going to start calling a connect gathering. For anybody that wants to kind of help connect in a Prairie Bible Church, it can be somebody that's coming for the first Sunday and want to learn about who we are and what we're doing. Maybe somebody that's been coming for a little while or even somebody that's been coming for a long while but wants to just get connected and find ways to plug in to what's going on here at Prairie Bible Church. The last Sunday of the month, 1115 Tell as long as it's got, just a real simple, casual gathering to answer questions and talk through about what's going on. All are welcome, anybody that wants to come, but that'll be next Sunday, 1115, probably here in the sanctuary, and want to know about that as well. Now, another way you can find out about that <clears throat> is if you're willing to just put your name and email or contact info down these clipboards. I'm going to start those around and be coming through, and then that'll put you on our weekly email list, too, to just know about some of the activities that are occurring here at Prairie Bible Church. And hopefully you can find out about that as well as going to our website. <clears throat> there is a, kind of a couple big things coming up as we come into the Lenten season. We get to celebrate as Christians the beauty of Easter and all that, that means that Jesus came and died for us and raised again for us. Here at Prayer Bible, we use that Lenten season as a way to kind of refresh and get into our studies even more. So starting uh, March 6th, we're going to be starting an all-church book study called The Reason for God. These are the study guides here. We're going to be doing that through our small groups, things outside of Sunday morning time. And there's some sign-up sheets on the back table. And I would love it if after service you go back there where these books are, look at the sign-up sheets and find a time of the week, a day of the time of the day that works well for you to maybe get into a small group and be able to study this book. And then grab a study guide when you're there. Take one home. They are $10 if you want to put into the Miracle Barn to support that. But either way, grab a book and get ready here. We'll be starting that in a couple weeks and hopefully you can get into a small group. Now, the beginning of Lenten, <clears throat> Lenten season, is truly uh, Ash Wednesday. And so we want to make sure everybody knows about that and that we will be having an Ash Wednesday service here March 2nd at 6.30. You'll hear more about that. But a great chance to get in and start that process and start that season of reflection and celebration that Easter really can be for us. So we hope everybody can be and join us for that as well. We continue our worship. Would you join me in an opening prayer this morning? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sunshine outside and the beautiful weather that you've given us today. It's amazing when you come from 20 below how 40 degrees can feel so beautiful. <clears throat> but we are thankful for it, Lord, for warming our hearts, warming our minds, and bringing us into this space. Lord, I thank you for each and every person that's here in this building this morning, as well as those that are worshiping online with us. You brought us all here for a reason, for a purpose. And we are very, very grateful, Lord. But I'm even more thankful for you coming with us. Lord, we invite you into this space, into this building that you would come. You've taught us where two or more are gathered, you are there. And I know you're here with us this morning, Lord, and I feel your presence and your spirit. And I pray that not only would you join us in this building and in these seats next to us, but join us in our hearts. We invite you into who we are, to come into us, to cleanse us from our thoughts, from our distractions, from all the things that are happening in the world. That we can take this time to refocus on our true purpose, worshiping you this morning as you so greatly deserve. I pray for the worship team, that the songs that they would lead us in would help bring music to your ears as we worship our Savior and our Lord. And the message that Pastor Brilly brings would be not his words, but yours coming through him that we need to hear this morning to fulfill us, to guide us, and to direct us out in this coming week. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue on worship this morning. Oh Lord, my God, 
When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands hath made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, I hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. As we continue to worship, we're going to introduce a new song this week. And while I was listening to this the first time, I just thought it was pretty much everything that Prairie Bible stands for. Just some of the lyrics say, my hope is only Jesus. My sin has been defeated. My chains are released. I am free. And I can encourage you guys to sing along if you feel comfortable. But over that, I just want you guys to listen to the words um, because this thing is jam-packed with everything that we believe. And it's great to sing that together. So sing with me this morning. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? 
There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is displayed To this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future is sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and never is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free at night, I, but through Christ. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat at night. But through Christ in me, to this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat at night, I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips Father, I just thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, that he could die to give us this freedom that our chains can be released. Uh, I just pray that you just pour your love over Billy and everyone here this morning as the message is pre uh, said. And 
I just pray that we receive what you have for us this morning and throughout this week and going forward in eternity. Just, I pray that you be with us and that we can be with you because of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Billy. I'm the associate pastor here. And what we like to do first at Prairie Bible is have our kids come forward. So kids, could you come up here? Don't leave me hanging. We got a lot more at 10 than 8.30. Well, if you're new here, we like to extend a hand over our kids as we pray over them and send them to class. Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you, Lord, for their instructors and their parents. I pray that as they go to class right now that uh, you would speak the word of God to them and that they could learn more about the name of Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. You guys are dismissed. As they're leaving, let's bow our heads and pray over the message. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much, Lord, for all the faces I see out here at at 10 and uh, for safe travels into church and for your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, apart from which we can do nothing and learn nothing. And we confess our humble dependence on you this morning uh, as we talk about a rather hard topic, but a necessary and important topic. We ask that above all else, the name of Jesus would be glorified this morning and that you would remove all distractions. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. This is page 1134 of the Bibles under your chairs. Feel free to keep that Bible as our gift to you if you'd like to have it. Uh, We're in the ESV, the English Standard Version, and I am building on a message Pastor Craig gave last week. Uh, Pastor Craig preached on 1 Corinthians 6.12, and we are looking at 1 Corinthians 6.12 through 20, and the message is titled, Bought with a Price. Now, as you're opening your Bibles, I want you to imagine with me that you are on a journey, okay? You are on a journey, and as you are walking on this journey, suddenly you look to the side and you notice this big, bright, sparkling building. And no one's around, and the door is cracked open. Now, if you're like me, you're going in that building. You want to know what's in there. So you start heading towards the building, but as you get a bit closer, suddenly you notice something above the door. And it is a large sign that says in all caps, KEEP OUT. Now, if you're like me, you really want to go in this building. But as you get closer, you notice in fine print under KEEP OUT, it says on the sign, DANGEROUS CHEMICALS AND EXPLOSIVES. In other words, KEEP OUT OF THIS BUILDING OR YOUR LIFE IS AT RISK. Now, if you're like me, you're going to turn around because you don't want to risk your life going in that building. Why do I use that illustration? Well, when it comes to our bodies as Christians and what we engage in with our bodies, there are certain buildings with doors that God has put signs above the door that say, keep out. Now, we tend to pay a lot of attention to the words keep out. We think God is trying to remove fun from our lives, trying to keep us from pleasure. And we fail to read the fine print under it that says dangerous chemicals and explosives inside. In other words, keep out of there because if you go in there, your life is at risk. I love you too much to let you go in that building. The take-home message overarching this entire message is this. God has ultimate authority over my body in order to protect me. God has ultimate authority over my body in order to protect me. And he doesn't shut the door to certain buildings because he doesn't want us to have fun or because he doesn't want us to have certain pleasures. He does it to protect our lives. And one of the doors he has shut and put a sign above it that says, keep out, is the door of sexual immorality. 
Okay, if you look at your Bibles above verses 12 through 20, you'll likely see a title that says something like Flee Sexual Immorality. But in order to understand what sexual immorality is, because it's kind of a broad word, we need to understand what God's design for sex is. Because uh, sometimes in the church, maybe you've experienced this, we tend to demonize sex and we act like it's a bad thing when it's a very good thing that God created for us to enjoy. But God's design for sex is one man, one woman, one marriage for life. It's that simple. The Bible teaches that God's design for sex is one man, one woman, one marriage for life. Now having said that, I want to be honest with you guys and tell you that this has been a hard week for me, a weighty week, because I understand that so many of us come to Christ out of situations and families and relationships of brokenness, where sexual sin is in our pasts in various forms because we live in a broken, sinful world. I understand that uh, the issue of divorce is among Christians. You know, the Bible has permitted divorce on certain grounds, one being adultery, another being a desertion by an unbelieving spouse. Or maybe you were a person who wasn't a Christian and you experienced a divorce and then you came to know the riches of Christ and turned your life towards Him. Maybe you're a person who experienced a divorce before you were more spiritually mature. This message is not to crush you or to pull up old wounds and cause you unnecessary pain. I believe God can redeem pasts like that. Maybe you're a person who Uh, has suffered the consequences of someone else's sexual sin, and I'm talking about sexual abuse. And if that happened to you, you were wronged, and I know that Jesus Christ can redeem that. Maybe you're a Christian who had a former life where you were formerly promiscuous, and at rock bottom, you turned to Christ, and he redeemed you. I'm telling you, Christ can redeem that type of past. Maybe you're a person who's been a lifelong Christian, but you had a season of rebellion against God, like the prodigal son, where you were promiscuous. I'm telling you, if you turn to Christ, even this morning, God can redeem that too. That's why 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, and such were some of you, that's past tense, were, you used to be this way, but you were sanctified, justified, you were washed In the name of Jesus Christ, listen, Jesus is an expert in redeeming pasts. And the point this morning is not to over wound you again and again over the past. My question this morning is to ask us as a church, is this our past or our present? Are we still engaging in these practices? Because Christ has called us out of the filth of sexual immorality, of sexual sin. Now that we understand God's design for sex, one man, one woman, one marriage for life, we can understand what sexual immorality is. Sexual immorality is any sexual thought or action that is outside of God's created design. Any sexual thought or action outside of one man, one woman, one marriage for life is sexual immorality. There's different translations for this. Some translations might say fornication. Uh, that refers to sex outside of marriage. But whether it's sex outside of marriage or before marriage or affairs that happen in marriage or pornography or sex with the same sex, these are all different forms of sexual immorality. Now, as a church, uh, maybe you've experienced the pain of the church shaming certain sexually immoral sins more than other ones. And I'm here to tell you, they're all sin. It doesn't mean one's way worse than the other one. Sometimes we get that wrong. The point is, sexual immorality is a sin against God, and when it comes to that sin, God has said, keep out. And he doesn't say it to take fun from our lives. He says it to keep our lives intact, to keep us from destroyed relationships and marriages and warped minds and destroyed souls. This is serious, guys. 
as I was prepping this message, I thought to myself, I don't think the issue is that we take this too seriously in the church. I think the issue is we don't take it seriously enough. This matters to God. Now, the Bible in the New Testament was written in Greek, and again, I try not to nerd out on you guys too much, but there's times where the original language word is helpful for understanding something. And the Greek word for sexual immorality is the word porneia, okay? Porneia, that's where, uh, it's from this root word that we get the term pornography. That sinister, soul-destroying form of sexual immorality that is not just wreaking havoc on the culture, it's wreaking havoc on the church. I'm reminded of a pastor uh, who'd been in ministry for several decades And uh, he was called to the deathbed of an old man, presumably in his church, uh, presumably a longtime Christian. And as he was at his bedside, he asked the man, he said, Sir, um, what can we pray about before you meet with God, before you die? And the man looked at the pastor and sadly said, Pastor, I just could not get the victory over pornography. What? What? Listen. Sexual immorality is a cruel master that wants to control you and destroy your life. And it's serious. I'm also reminded of being in a chapel and seeing a man stand up and praise God that after years of a battle with sexual addiction, he was 12 years clean of pornography and all other sexual immorality. Praise God. We serve a Lord who can deliver us from this cruel master. So on one hand, it's serious. On the other hand, Jesus Christ has overcome the world and he's able to overcome the sin in our lives. You know, the Corinthian culture was totally sexually immoral. In fact, the term Corinthiazo came to be a tagline to describe a sexually immoral person. On the south side of the city of Corinth, on top of a hill, uh, there was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, and day after day, men would ascend that hill and engage in sexual immorality with uh, temple priestesses. So this was a culture mired in sexual filth. And the issue is not with the outside world, guys. The issue is not in our job to judge the world. It's not our job to judge the world. It's God's job to judge outsiders. But we are called to judge the church, to discern within ourselves if this exists among us. And that was the issue Paul is addressing. Apparently, there were some Corinthian Christians who were seeking to justify sexual sin in their lives. They were trying to say, I belong to Christ, but I'm also going to continue to go to prostitutes, or I'm going to continue to have sex outside of marriage. And they were using two slogans uh, to do this. The first one you see in verse 12, it says, all things are lawful for me. You'll likely see it's in quotes in your Bible. The Corinthian Christians were saying, all things are lawful for me. That means I'm free to sin. Well, Paul's going to address that, that slogan. The second one is they were saying, food is for the body and the body for food. In other words, they were saying, uh, just like food is a base pleasure I can enjoy, so is any type of sex I want to enjoy because it's just this natural base need I have. And Paul's going to address that too. A disordered view of sex starts with a disordered view of the body. And in these nine verses, Paul is going to refer to the body eight times. Let's see what Paul speaks into this situation and what we can learn from it. Let's look at our Bibles. Now, as I read these slogans, I'm going to read them as Paul quoting the Corinthians back to them because that is what he's doing. Look at verse 12. Paul says, You say, Corinthians, all things are lawful for me. But I say to you, Not all things are helpful. You say, Corinthians, all things are lawful for me. But I say to you, I will not be dominated by anything. 
You say to me, Corinthians, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy both one and the other. But I say to you, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never, that's a strong emphatic, that's, may it never happen. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. These are God's words for us this morning. And we are going to be talking about what the Bible says about our bodies. Okay? So we do not take our cues from the culture when it comes to our bodies and when it comes to sex. We take our cues from the word of God and from the Bible. And Paul is going to be really clear in these verses about what the Bible says about our bodies. So there are brochures on your seats. There are some fill in the blanks on there if you want to take notes. Uh, Here is the first one if you're taking notes. The Bible says that my body has sexual boundaries. The Bible says that my body has sexual boundaries. In verse 13, Paul says to the Corinthians, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. In other words, we weren't meant for this. We weren't physiologically meant for sexual immorality. We weren't mentally or spiritually meant to live that type of life. I've heard it said that anything God-given is God-governed. Anything God-given is God-governed. Here's what I mean. When God gives us a gift, he doesn't just carelessly give us the gift and just say, have at it, do whatever you want with this thing. No, he gives us something good, in this case, sex. And he says, this is a good thing, but these are the boundaries for enjoying sex the right way. Anything God-given is God-governed. God created sex. And because God created sex, God has the sole right to define sex, to set its boundaries. And the boundaries God has set on sex is one man, one woman, one marriage for life. What is the evidence that our bodies weren't made for sexual immorality? Well, if you're in the church long enough and you've sat in counseling rooms with people who've engaged in premarital sex and then broken up, and you see the heart-wrenching reality of what that does to a person, or the proliferation of sexually transmitted diseases that are spreading across our world. When sex is engaged in outside of God's design, there are disastrous consequences. For the outside world, but also for us as Christians, there are consequences in this life for sin. Listen, the culture around you treats sex casually, doesn't it? But there's nothing casual about sex. It is serious every time. Within marriage, it is a wonderful, serious thing that binds two people together. Outside of marriage, it has devastating consequences for people mentally, physically, and spiritually. The culture treats sex transactionally Like it's a cheap transaction, but it's a costly transaction. It is costly every time. Do not be deceived, Christians. Sex is serious. And we would do well to remember that. The Bible says that my body has sexual boundaries. Here's the second one. The Bible says that my body belongs to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 15. 
Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. You know, that never reminds me of of the never when Paul said, uh, shall I sin more so that grace may abound? Never, right? Now, I mentioned that the Corinthians were using these two slogans to justify sexual sin among them. They were saying, all things are lawful for me. And Pastor Craig talked about that uh, last week. What they were essentially saying is, uh, we're free to sin, right? We're, we can do whatever we want. You know what that is? That's a lie from the pit of hell from our culture. What that lie tells us is, tells us is that true freedom is being able to do whatever you want. That's a lie. True freedom is holiness in Christ. That is what the Bible teaches us. The Bible says that he who sins is a slave to sin. Listen, you can be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness, a slave to Christ. One of them is a far better master. We are free uh, to be free from sin. We are not free to continue in sin. May that never be said about us as Christians. The other punchline they were using is they were saying, food is for the body and the body for food and God will destroy both one and the other. And Craig addressed this when he talked about antinomianism. Antinomianism, a word that I struggle to say every time I say it, was this false belief uh, that the body doesn't matter. You know, it's this belief that, you know, when Christ returns, the body will be destroyed and I'm a spiritual being, so things like food and sex, even illicit sex, don't really matter. And Paul says, no, that is not true, Christians. He says the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. Listen, if you are questioning whether the body matters, consider this. God himself in Jesus Christ, took on a body. It mattered enough that Jesus Christ uh, incarnated a body, came here, lived a sinless life, and died for you and me in a body. The body matters. How we treat the body matters. The body matters so much that when Christ returns, you and I will be given a resurrection body. And for eternity, we will have a resurrection body. Listen, the body matters. It matters in how we approach sex. It matters in how we eat and drink. It matters in how we treat this earth and other material things. Don't believe the lie, Christian, that your body doesn't matter. It does. And it belongs to Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us that the church is the body of Christ. And so when you accept Christ, you become a member of the body of Christ. And what you do as a member of the body of Christ, affects the other members of the body of Christ. Our sin, particularly in this message, our sexual sin, can have a devastating impact, not just on us, but on other Christians and on our church. And may it be said about Prairie Bible Church that we take sex seriously, that we remain holy, that we remain a pure bride to Christ. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that my body has sexual boundaries. The Bible says that my body belongs to Jesus Christ. Third, the Bible says that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Look at verses 18 and 19 with me. Paul says, flee sexual immorality. You know what that word flee means? Run. It doesn't mean rationalize it. It doesn't mean put yourself in situations where you know you'll be tempted by it. It doesn't mean text with it. It means run from it. Because it is is a powerful, cruel master that wants to destroy your life. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. It has devastating consequences on our bodies. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You know what that means? 
It means that everywhere you and I go, everything you and I see, everything you and I watch or think, guess who's right there with us if we're a Christian? God. You know, in this life, when we accept Jesus Christ, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Praise God for that. What a blessing. Also, what a terror if you're living in sexual sin. The question I want to ask you this morning is as the Holy Spirit is in you as a guest, does the Holy Spirit feel at home in you? I'm reminded of people like Enoch in the Old Testament. It says that Enoch walked 300 years with God, then he was no more, for God took him. Sounds like the Holy Spirit was a guest that enjoyed dwelling in Enoch because he lived a holy life. My question for you, is the Holy Spirit happy to dwell in you? Or can the Holy Spirit not wait to get out? Because you're quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit with what you entertain yourself with, with sexual sin. It's a comforting thought that when you become a Christian, you are no longer ever alone. Isn't that amazing? You are never alone. And it's a terrifying thought that if you are living in patterns of sexual sin as a Christian, you are putting God through everything you're engaging in. May we be found as temples of the Holy Spirit that please the Holy Spirit and don't quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Bible says that my body has sexual boundaries. The Bible says that my body belongs to Jesus Christ. The Bible says that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Last, the Bible says that my body exists for God's glory. For God's glory. Look at verse 20. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You know what price Paul is referring to here? It's, it's the right answer for 99% of questions in the church, Jesus. <laughs> He's talking about the costly, precious sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf, right? I remember uh, I had a professor say to me once, and it stuck with me, he said, if you are ever tempted to not take sin in your life seriously, just remember what God did to deal with it, Right? He sent his only son to die a horrific death on a cross to deal with our sin. How then could we be found as people who return to that sin and trample on the Son of God? We were bought with a precious, costly sacrifice. And may we leave behind the old life. We are called to glorify God in our bodies. The culture tells us to glorify ourselves, to honor ourselves, to to bring pleasure to ourselves. And while this is our body, at some level, really the authority over our body belongs to God. The Bible says that we exist for God's glory. This reminds me of a story in the Old Testament. So when you think about the price that Jesus bought us with, I'm reminded of the book of Hosea, okay? And in the book of Hosea, God came to the prophet Hosea and he asked him to do something totally unconscionable to us. He asked Hosea to go and marry an adulterous woman and her name was Gomer. And God asked the prophet Hosea to do that knowing full well what was going to happen after Hosea married Gomer. And after Hosea married Gomer, Gomer ran off and committed adultery against Hosea over and over and over again. And there are some pictures in that book that are amazing. Like Gomer being in the house with her lovers and Hosea as her husband still goes to the house, goes into the house and takes care of Gomer even while she remains with her other lovers. Well, Gomer hits rock bottom. And towards the end of that book, Gomer is on the bidding block. She is naked, exposed and ashamed, standing on a bidding block being bid on by other people. I'd imagine that her head was down when suddenly she heard five shekels, ten shekels, fifteen shekels, and she looked up, and guess who was bidding on Gomer? Her husband, Hosea. 
She must have thought to herself then, well, he just wants to buy me back to take revenge on me. But once he bought her back, that was never Hosea's intention. You know what Hosea's intention was? It was to tenderly love and care for Gomer, his wife, and to forgive her. Now let me ask you something. How should Gomer treat Hosea after that? How unconscionable would it be for Gomer to return to her lovers after Hosea bought her back? Well, listen, this isn't about being hard on Gomer. This is an illustration that God put in his word for us because we are sinners. And through Jesus Christ, God has reached into the flea market of sin and dragged us out. He has purchased us off the bidding block. Now, let me ask you a question. If God has done that much for us, how should we treat God? How unconscionable would it be for us to return to our other lovers, one being sexual sin? You were bought with a price. You are not your own. So glorify God in your bodies. You can't serve two masters. Why would you ever want to serve the cruel master of sexual immorality when you've been given to a loving master in Jesus Christ? Band, you can come up. As we get ready to close, uh, God has ultimate authority over our bodies, but it is to protect us. And the Bible teaches us that our bodies have sexual boundaries, they belong to Jesus Christ, they are temples of the Holy Spirit, and they exist for God's glory. I just want to close with this. I am not naive to the fact that there is some type of fleshly pleasure payoff to sexual sin or else the church wouldn't be struggling with it so much. I understand that this is hard. But you want to know how you overcome that? Three words. God is better. God is better. Psalm 16 says about the Lord, in your presence is fullness of joy in your right hand are pleasures forever. Listen, when you stack up the fleeting pleasures of sexual sin against the eternal pleasures that are in the right hand of God, this is far greater. So why do we cling to this? God is better. And the first step towards God is giving your life to Jesus Christ. If you've never made that decision, you're fighting a losing battle. You can't win the battle over things like this. But once you turn to Christ, you're never alone again. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, God will sanctify you and you will then belong to a loving, tender master. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down to the entrance seen by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh praise Him At break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. 
Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord. of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise Sunday you come to church, it's really uplifting, joyful sermon message, is it? But it all comes from here. And while it may not all be really happy and joyful, it is all truth. It's all real. It's all what God wanted us to hear today. I also learned something today. Pastor Craig's a smarter man than I realize. This tough sermon, you notice he gave off to Pastor Billy? <laughs> Smart guy, isn't he? There's two things I kind of heard from the message today that I'm going to take out. One is, with all the trouble, with all the challenges, with all the sin that I have, because of that and what Jesus did, I'm saved. And that is a joyful message we got to remember as we leave here today. Amen. The second thing is, in today's world, there's still a lot of trouble. There's still a lot of things outside of these walls that want to influence who we are or what we believe or what we think is right we got to protect ourselves from that. Not only as the church, but then be an example to the world of what really is the truth. That's our goal. That's our purpose here on this earth. To be a simple and authentic representation of Jesus' love. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you each and every day. I thank you for going to that cross to wash away my sin. I will pray that same prayer tomorrow as I will thank you again for taking my sin away because I know I will sin again. And I am sorry for that, Lord. But I am grateful that you will continue to forgive me and continue to lead me forward to be better, to be more in your image. Lord, and I pray for everybody that's here that we all feel your presence, feel your glory, and know that God is better, that you will lead us your, your gifts and your blessing is better than anything we could ever receive on this earth. Help us remember that as we move forward from this place, that your blessing and your guidance will go as we go into the challenging world that exists outside these doors. But you're always with us. You're always there for us. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.
Isn't that amazing? You are never alone. And it's a terrifying thought that if you are living in patterns of sexual sin as a Christian, you are putting God through everything you're engaging in. May we be found as temples of the Holy Spirit that please the Holy Spirit and don't quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Bible says that my body has sexual boundaries. The Bible says that my body belongs to Jesus Christ. The Bible says that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Last, the Bible says that my body exists for God's glory. For God's glory. Look at verse 20. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You know what price Paul is referring to here? It's, it's the right answer for 99% of questions in the church, Jesus. <laughs> He's talking about the costly, precious sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf, right? I remember uh, I had a professor say to me once, and it stuck with me, he said, if you are ever tempted to not take sin in your life seriously, just remember what God did to deal with it, Right? He sent his only son to die a horrific death on a cross to deal with our sin. How then could we be found as people who return to that sin and trample on the Son of God? We were bought with a precious, costly sacrifice. And may we leave behind the old life. We are called to glorify God in our bodies. The culture tells us to glorify ourselves, to honor ourselves, to to bring pleasure to ourselves. And while this is our body, at some level, really the authority over our body belongs to God. The Bible says that we exist for God's glory. This reminds me of a story in the Old Testament. So when you think about the price that Jesus bought us with, I'm reminded of the book of Hosea, okay? And in the book of Hosea, God came to the prophet Hosea and he asked him to do something totally unconscionable to us. He asked Hosea to go and marry an adulterous woman and her name was Gomer. And God asked the prophet Hosea to do that knowing full well what was going to happen after Hosea married Gomer. And after Hosea married Gomer, Gomer ran off and committed adultery against Hosea over and over and over again. And there are some pictures in that book that are amazing. Like Gomer being in the house with her lovers and Hosea as her husband still goes to the house, goes into the house and takes care of Gomer even while she remains with her other lovers. Well, Gomer hits rock bottom. And towards the end of that book, Gomer is on the bidding block. She is naked, exposed and ashamed, standing on a bidding block being bid on by other people. I'd imagine that her head was down when suddenly she heard five shekels, ten shekels, fifteen shekels. And she looked up, and guess who was bidding on Gomer? Her husband, Hosea. She must have thought to herself then, well, he just wants to buy me back to take revenge on me. But once he bought her back, That was never Hosea's intention. You know what Hosea's intention was? It was to tenderly love and care for Gomer, his wife, and to forgive her. Now let me ask you something. How should Gomer treat Hosea after that? How unconscionable would it be for Gomer to return to her lovers after Hosea bought her back? Well, listen. This isn't about being hard on Gomer. This is an illustration that God put in his word for us. Because we are sinners. And through Jesus Christ, God has reached into the flea market of sin and dragged us out. He has purchased us off the bidding block. Now let me ask you a question. If God has done that much for us, how should we treat God? How unconscionable would it be for us to return to our other lovers, one being sexual sin. You were bought with a price. You are not your own. So glorify God in your bodies. You can't serve two masters. 
Why would you ever want to serve the cruel master of sexual immorality when you've been given to a loving master in Jesus Christ? Band, you can come up as we get ready to close. God has ultimate authority over our bodies, but it is to protect us. And the Bible teaches us that our bodies have sexual boundaries, they belong to Jesus Christ, they are temples of the Holy Spirit, and they exist for God's glory. I just want to close with this. I am not naive to the fact that there is some type of fleshly pleasure payoff to sexual sin, or else the church wouldn't be struggling with it so much. I understand that this is hard. But you want to know how you overcome that? Three words. God is better. God is better. Psalm 16 says about the Lord, in your presence is fullness of joy, in your right hand are pleasures forever. Listen, when you stack up the fleeting pleasures of sexual sin, against the eternal pleasures that are in the right hand of God, this is far greater. So why do we cling to this? God is better. And the first step towards God is giving your life to Jesus Christ. If you've never made that decision, you're fighting a losing battle. You can't win the battle over things like this. But once you turn to Christ, you're never alone again. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, God will sanctify you And you will then belong to a loving, tender master. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance seen by heavy stone, Messiah still and all unknown. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name for. For endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name for of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face 
Sunday you come to church, it's really uplifting, joyful sermon, message, is it? But it all comes from here. And while it may not all be really happy and joyful, it is all truth. It's all real. It's all what God wanted us to hear today. I also learned something today. Pastor Craig's a smarter man than I realize. This tough sermon, you notice he gave off to Pastor Billy? <laughs> Smart guy, isn't he? There's two things I kind of heard from the message today that I'm going to take out. One is, with all the trouble, with all the challenges, with all the sin that I have, because of that and what Jesus did, I'm saved. And that is a joyful message we got to remember as we leave here today. The second thing is, in today's world, there's still a lot of trouble. There's still a lot of things outside of these walls that want to influence who we are or what we believe or what we think is right. And we got to protect ourselves from that. Not only as a church, but then be an example to the world of what really is the truth. That's our goal. That's our purpose here on this earth. To be a simple and authentic representation of Jesus' love. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you each and every day. I thank you for going to that cross to wash away my sin. I will pray that same prayer tomorrow as I will thank you again for taking my sin away because I know I will sin again. And I am sorry for that, Lord. But I am grateful that you will continue to forgive me and continue to lead me forward to be better, to be more in your image. Lord, and I pray for everybody that's here that we all feel your presence, feel your glory, and know that God is better, that you will lead us Your your gifts and your blessing is better than anything we could ever receive on this earth. Help us remember that as we move forward from this place, that your blessing and your guidance will go as we go into the challenging world that exists outside these doors. But you're always with us. You're always there for us. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.